Hello and welcome to episode one of Rabbit Hole Reviews. Today we're going to do a tabletop review of the Sig Sauer P230 pocket pistol. And in this case, this example being in 380 automatic. Uh, it was also imported in 32 automatic, also known as 765 Browning. Those are the two calibers you're going to see in the U.S. Let's go over some specs before we get started. Operation is a semi-automatic fixed barrel straight blowback. Trigger is double action, single action, or double action only. The overall length is 6.6 .6 inches. The height of 4.7 inches. Width of 1.2 inches. Has a barrel length of 3.6 inches. Rifling twist of 1 in 10 inches with 6 grooves. Has a sight radius of 4.7 inches. And uh, the weight without a magazine, they listed at 16.2 ounces. So we will test that now to see what uh, my numbers come up with. Um, Sixteen point six ounces without a magazine. Now keep in mind this is a sample size of one, and this is my scale. So depending on how accurate of a scale I have, it could be off. So it, I think it's fairly close to the published numbers. Uh, the trigger pull on this, they claim a trigger pull of nine point nine pounds. Uh, mine doesn't feel like nine point nine pounds, but we'll test that in a minute. So double action is 9.9 .9 pounds. The single action is uh, 3.7 pounds. So you're having an, also a magazine capacity of 7 plus 1 rounds in 380. If you opt for the 32 caliber version, you're going to get an extra round. So it's going to be 8 plus 1 for 32 and 7 plus 1 for 380. So let's go ahead and test the trigger pull on this before we talk about some of the history and some of the details of the handgun. We'll test both uh, single action and double action. I'll take three samples pulls and see what we come up with. I'm not going to take an average. I'm just going to give you an idea of what we're looking at. Uh, so we're looking at 6.8 for the first pull. Seven point two. Now uh, we'll do a redo on that one. 8.4. So all three trigger pulls were less than the claimed almost 10 pound trigger pull on double action. So let's see what we're working with single action. See if the numbers bear out to the 3.75 pound claimed pull. Two point six pounds. Two point eight pounds. And again, two point eight pounds. So my pistol came in lower on both the single action and double action pulls than the published numbers that I have. I will say that both in single action and double action, especially double action, it's a very smooth trigger pull. Not only do my uh, trigger pulls indicate a lighter weight, it's actually deceptively smooth. So when you think of a nine pound trigger, you're thinking of something like a, I don't know, there's lots of weapons that have heavy trigger pulls. Let's say like a HK-91 or a G3 stock trigger that, you know, that's, that's a heavy, unforgiving block of a trigger. Uh, and that's roughly 12 pounds, at least in some of the examples I have. So just because it says 9.9 .9 pounds, uh, depending on what examples you find, you may find them to be actually lighter than the published weights. And they're definitely smooth. So a, an eight pound trigger that's very smooth and predictable will feel lighter and it'll be more practical. I do fire this pistol, not regularly, but when I fired it in double action and I would decock the pistol each time to get the practice of having the first shot off, 
Uh, I didn't feel like I was stacking the trigger or anything like that. It was very smooth. It was just, you know, pre pressure, 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 and then it broke, and then, you know, clean follow through. So uh, while I'm no expert on triggers, uh, I had no problems with it. I had no complaints. It's not bad for a stock trigger. So let's get into the history of this pistol, right? So originally it was designed in 1977. It was aimed at the German police market. The German police decided not to go with this pistol as a backup or even a primary sidearm. They ended up going with larger handguns like the... Uh, SIG P225, which is known as the P5, the HK P7, which is the, uh, you know, that's a unique pistol. That's a the squeak, squeeze cock design with a, uh, with a somewhat of a gas system in it. So uh, I had one of those years ago. They're pretty expensive now. You're not going to see those. Um, but the West German police decided to go up in caliber. Uh, they had carried 380s and 32s in the, in the past, um, immediately post-war and before the wars. And they decided to get away from that uh, for, for good reason. Uh, now, you're going to be carrying something like a 230 or be interested in something like a 380 automatic for one reason only, I would think. And it's not for the ballistics of the cartridge. What 380 allows you to do is have weapons that are considerably less complex and smaller than, say, a 9mm or larger. That's because 380 allows you to have pinned fixed barrel designs and uh, straight blowback. So they're very simple to manufacture. They're inherently accurate because of the pin barrel, the fixed barrel, and um, they can be made quite small. Now in this case, the 230 is not considered small by today's pocket pistol sizes uh, and standards. Uh, today you're looking at polymer frame striker fired handguns like Competitors would be something like a Smith & Wesson Bodyguard, uh, which is considerably smaller, lighter, and less expensive. Uh, you do sacrifice one round in capacity, so you're looking at 6 plus 1. And also, another competitor, strong competitor, would be a Glock 42, which is considerably more customizable than a SIG 230. And again, you sacrifice one round, but it's Glock, so it's, guaranteed, it's not guaranteed to go bang, but they're inherently accurate and reliable handguns. They're bulletproof. So why would you choose a 230 over modern pocket pistols? Well, there's two things. If you like the decock mechanism, there are not too many handguns out there that are gonna have that nowadays. That's pretty much a SIG thing. And I'm not saying that they're the only manufacturer that had a uh, decock lever, but they're the ones that are most commonly known for it. So the decock lever, which is right about here, is a lever to take the weapon from fully cocked with a round in the chamber to safely decocking it. So the way you do that on a handgun like this, of course, it's safety checked, uh, as all handguns are. There's no ammunition present. Let's assume that you've loaded the handgun, there's a round in the chamber and a magazine in the magazine well. There's no external safety. There's no lever I can flip up like a 1911. There's no cock and lock. There's no decock like a Beretta M9, anything like that. What you do have is a decock lever. That's your only safety. So you've loaded the pistol, it's hot, and you want to make it safe for carry. Just simply push down on the lever and release. It goes, it brings the hammer from full cock to full decock, and it's safe to carry in this manner. I happen to like that manual of arms. That's why I have multiple SIGs for that reason. I'm used to that. Uh, if you don't like having things like uh, no external safety, you know, think Glocks. They don't have any external safeties either. They have the, the trigger safety, and that's pretty much it as far as at practical use. Um, another big feature that you're not going to see on pocket pistols today, even the smallest of the small, is this has a heel magazine release. So that's a European thing. Uh, even the Europeans have gotten away from that. So what you look here, you see on the bottom of the pistol, you see a, uh, a button. It's more of like a, a ledge or a, I don't know what you would call that. We'll just call it a button. You have to deliberately pull back on this button while holding the pistol with your firing hand and manually remove the magazine. So in this case, you're done firing the weapon. The slide will stay to the rear because it has an internal 
slide lock, not an external, but an internal. So it will keep the slide to the rear and it'll also keep the slide to the rear when you, when you remove the magazine. So it's ready to load the next round. So you fired your seventh or eighth round. The magazine is now empty. What you would do is you would reach down with your non-firing hand and with your thumb, take hold of the lever, push to the rear and manually remove the magazine. So what that forces you to do is keep positive control of the magazine in your non-firing hand. The idea behind that is you, the magazines are not just expendable items. Uh, you can't just drop the magazine in the dirt and keep moving in a gunfight. The idea is I have this magazine in my non-firing hand. In order for me to retrieve another fully loaded magazine, I must stow or put, do something with this magazine, whether it be put it in a pocket, a pouch, or somewhere. The idea was not to have it on the ground. So you take that empty magazine, stow it either in a pouch, and then put another, now we'll assume that this magazine is now loaded, a fresh magazine. You put it back in the pistol, it has to, you have to lock it in place, it's a deliberate motion. And uh, with a round in the chamber, it would, uh, it would deactivate the slide lock. And with this magazine fully seated and around in the top, you could just pull back on the slide serrations and you have to manually load the, the weapon being careful not to short stroke it or ride the slide forward. You have to pull back and release. That's, that needs all the spring pressure it can get to, to strip a magazine out of the, 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 the magazine itself. It's a single stack magazine. They're very basic magazines. They're, they're inexpensive to produce. They may not be inexpensive to procure, but they are very simple magazines to make. Um, so again, why would I want this, right? In 2022, it's a 45 year old design. Why not go with the Glock 42? Well, if you have larger hands like myself, something like a 230 allows you to really get a good purchase on the weapon. Because it's seven plus one rounds, you don't have a pinky hanging off the end like a Walther PPKS, or there's lots of handguns out there that if you don't have that, that pinky, that finger extension, you, you're out of luck. You're, you're, one of your fingers is hanging off the end. Um, these are blowback designs, so depending on the cartridge, the loading that you're using, if it's full power defense loads, they can be pretty snappy. The 230 I found not to be the case. It's it's very manageable. It's partly because it's it's heavier. You know, you're looking at a 20 20 ounce plus pistol loaded, which is roughly the same weight of an empty Glock 19, and it has a fairly large, oversized hard plastic grip, so it'll, it gives you good purchase on the frame. The sights, I find the sights to be excellent. So what you're looking at sight-wise, you're looking at um, a dot and a dash. So here we go to decock the pistol, because you know we like to be safe. Dot and a dash. So if you're familiar with the, the Beretta M9 service pistol, it's very similar to that, for those of you who have military uh, experience. Uh, I like it, it's very intuitive. I think with a pocket pistol of this size, you're not really gonna line up a, two dots and a dash. I have other 380s that have that arrangement and they're also good, but I've used lots of different handguns and weapons in general. So I'm used to having the, the dot and the dash, that's, that's sufficient. I think the only downside to something like this is that the 230, if you notice on the, on the, the slide, this front sight post is machined into the, to the slide. So it's part of the slide. So you wanna put night sights on there, it's not really gonna happen. Not without some major work and work that I don't think you'd wanna do. Uh, the rear sight on the 230 is dovetailed, so you can drift adjust it and you can replace it, but the front is what you get is what you get. Now they fixed that on the subsequent design, the SIG 232. Uh, that's a handgun that we can get into now because if you're looking at the 230 line, you're gonna find one of those two designs. It's either gonna be a 230, which was produced from 1977 to 1996, um, or the 232, which took over in 96, and their production and importation ran to 2014. So all those guns in the 230 or 230 line are going to be new old stock, unsold, or in someone's collection, or used. Um, but you have two different iterations to choose from. I think you could be served well with either pistol. The 232 had some design changes. There's roughly 60, 60 changes that were made. Uh, the big ones uh, are a um, hammer block safety that was added to an already safe design, but they added another 
layer of safety to it. And of course, the both the front and rear sights are dovetailed and removable. So that's that's a nice thing to have. If you want to put uh, Trojicons or any kind of other sights on there, you have the option to do that easily. Just keep in mind, if you buy a 232 and you want to put hard plastic grips from a 230 on your 232, that's not going to work. Vice versa, if you have uh, you want to put 232 grips that you found somewhere online or you want to buy it and you want to put it on your 230, that's also not going to work. So the grips that you have between those two guns are not interchangeable. They have aftermarket grips. Just make sure that they're compatible with the, the design. That was just one of those idiosyncr idiosyncratic things that they, for some reason, the, the grips were not interchangeable. Both are excellent handguns. They are, uh, what's, what's the takeaway on this video? Um, very well made. The attention to detail is excellent. SIG, especially in this era in the 70s and the 80s, uh, were excellent handguns. Uh, everything they made was was quite nice. Uh, you're just not going to find pistols this well made. Even things like new Walthers and stuff, they don't really compare in terms of elegance and manufacture uh, compared to something like a 19 mid 1980s SIG like this one. Accuracy is excellent, uh, as to be expected with a fixed barrel design. Terminal ballistics on a 380. That's if you're getting into any kind of pocket pistol caliber and 380, that's pretty much comes to the territory. What I will do uh, quickly, because I don't want to get into into, we could really go down the rabbit hole if we talk about calibers and start comparing calibers. But what I'll do in brief uh, is talk about one self defense load, and that self defense load is the um, Hornady Black, right? So Hornady Black. Out of a 380 automatic, you're looking at a thousand feet per second out of a four inch barrel. Now this has a, a 3.6 inch barrel, but for comparison's sake, that's fairly close. And you're looking at 200 feet or uh, foot pounds of energy at the muzzle. Now Hornady Black in nine millimeter, nine by 19 versus nine by 17, you're looking at 1155 feet per second and 341 feet. Uh, foot pounds of energy at the muzzle. So there's definitely um, a difference in performance, but it's a trade off because you're getting a small concealable handgun for deep cover concealment, like in an ankle holster. Uh, it's not really designed to be a primary handgun, uh, at least not in my mind, mainly because of the magazine capacity. You're looking at single stack seven plus one capacity in a handgun like this, whereas, you know, even a Glock 43X which is, yes, it's larger, but it has nine millimeter and with aftermarket magazines, you're looking at 15 rounds. So it's not competitive from that, that standpoint. Uh, this is more for a seasoned shooter who kind of really appreciates what they're looking at and is, is comfortable with seven rounds of 380. Um, you're not gonna be shooting matches with this. There's no tactical reloads with a heel magazine release. Um, who used these guns, right? Other than uh, hapless consumers like myself. So the German police really didn't adopt it too much, but the Swiss police did. And some police forces in the United States had these as backup and ankle holster guns. Um, I would imagine for detective use or in vice squads or things like that. Other notable users were the Japanese police. They, they use that um, probably because of their smaller stature. They like 380 handguns and that's sufficient for their police force in a country that really doesn't have a lot of uh, private ownership of firearms. I guess the 380 would be king. And uh, Libya also used these. I'm pretty sure they used them in some sort of police use. And a big user, well, not say a big user, but a uh, high profile user would be somebody like the SAS. So the Special Air Service, the British SAS did use these. So I think if it's good enough for the SAS, it's probably good enough for your average consumer. They appreciated the quality and the craftsmanship. So in summary, to keep this under 20 minutes, I would say if you can find a clean one uh, with reasonably priced, uh, I would say uh, purchase it. Uh, look long and hard before you buy stuff. Uh, they're out there. And um, that's really all I have for you guys today. Uh, let me know what you uh, think in the comment section, good or bad. This is a one take video. Um, my first video put on YouTube and uh, using uh, some pretty rudimentary equipment. So as I progress, you'll see things other than tabletops and you'll see live uh, action shooting, accuracy testing at distance and things like that. But for the foreseeable future, we're gonna do a lot of tabletops and just talk about specs and, and really uh, hopefully trade ideas on what you guys think. So that's all I have for you guys today. Um, until next time, thank you.